Right. So, yes, today I'm thinking about looking at birds as markers of time and markers of seasonality, particularly in the Scottish Islands, but also slightly further afield within the North Atlantic as a whole. This was work that I conducted largely for my PhD, which I did here with Jackie Mulville about four years ago, I finished that now. And it involved collating lots of existing bird bone data, but also then conducting new in-depth analyses of bone and eggshell. So, the Scottish Islands can broadly be classed as the Outer Hebrides, the Inner Hebrides, Shetland and Orkney, or also known as the Northern Isles for Shetland and Orkney, and the Hebrides for the other two. Now, these landscapes have a great range of habitats. They're very ecotonal. We have everything from mountains and cliffs to Macca, a kind of grassy dune land, the seascape itself. And these habitats provide a rich range of uh, nesting and breeding and feeding sites for a huge variety of birds. Today, much of coastal and island Scotland is really well known for its bird life. And with the diverse range of species, including some rare and vulnerable ones being present in the mainland, but also on the offshore islands and stacks, such as these ones here, which often hold very large populations. The Joint uh, Nature Conservation Committee has set up a load of special protected areas <coughs> indicated by these dots, and a lot of those fall in the Scottish islands. And these SPAs, they signify that a site is currently used by a certain number of birds in any given season, so for example 20,000 waterfowl, or has a high breeding success rate, or has a long time depth of a species breeding there. This is exemplified, for example, in the Scottish Islands by birds such as the gannet, which the vast majority of the British population of breeding gannets nest on these protected sites in Scotland. And when we think that Britain holds 60 to 70% of the world's breeding gannet populations, that's a huge amount of birds. A really good example of this is St Kilda, which is about 41 miles west of the outer coast of the Hebrides. And this houses the UK's largest populations currently of gannets, of fulmars, and of puffins. Now, historically speaking, St Kilda was a fowling nation. They subsisted on birds up until the 1930s when the remaining population were then evacuated and they took huge numbers <coughs> of seabirds and eggs from them as well. And one of my favourite quotes was recorded here by a reverend on the island in 1841 and he said, the people here are suffering very much from want of food. During spring, before the birds came, they literally cleared the shore of not only of shellfish but even of a species of seaweed. And this thought of waiting for the birds, longing for their return and for the influx and appearance of valuable resources became intrinsic to my consideration of bird exploitation in the past. Birds are some of the most mobile animals and the birds present in the Scottish islands are not there at all points of the year for a lot of species. Some species conduct long distance migrations from the southern hemisphere or moving between areas such as Iceland, Greenland and Britain. Other species may only come to land to breed, such as the gannet there, and at other points of the year they can be found either in local waters or some species further out to sea. Other birds cover very large feeding grounds and perhaps only return to land to roost at night. And the mobility of these birds can mark the passage of time and the change of season, altering a landscape with their comings and goings. And human interactions with these mobile creatures in the past can tell us potentially about how people perceived and experienced this yearly passage of time and made, the changing, uh, made use of the changing environments and resources around them. Within the Scottish islands, there are large populations of colony breeding seabirds who visit in summer and would have provided a concentrated resource base for intense or sporadic exploitation to get meat, fat, oils, eggs. But also in addition to this, there are winter visitors such as the Great Northern Diver that could provide additional resources in what could be a challenging point of the year. On a smaller scale, birds can be important markers of kind of a daily calendar. On St Kilda, there was one really unusual method of capturing birds recorded, that at dawn, when you were waiting for the guillemots to return, you went and you covered yourself with a cloth and pretended to be a poo-covered rock. The guillemots, very social, thought, oh, lots of birds here, and came and landed on you. 
and you caught them. But this could only be done at dawn. So we've got these little snapshots into the movement of birds and how, what point of the day you can access them. So what does the archaeological bone data tell us? Firstly, in most periods, there is a large focus on seabirds, <coughs> shown here in blue, and particularly gregariously breeding colony seabirds who visit the land in summer. But we still have important contributions made by waterfowls, um, such as geese and ducks, and by wading birds. Many sites appear to have a fowling pattern that is at once very focused but also quite diverse. So they might have a target species and then lots of other species <coughs> present only by one or two bones, perhaps showing a key focus and then opportuni opportunistic exploitation at other points. But we also have birds that are sourced locally and from further afield. And obviously I can't go into details for everything here today, but I'm just going to choose some case studies that explore this time and seasonality theme. If we start in the Mesolithic, Birds form a large part of the overall bone assemblage uh, in the Scottish islands in this period, being used alongside fish, sea mammals, and some land mammals. We only have a small number of sites with Mesolithic data, but we can see that it's very focused on orcs, which include things like the puffin, the extinct great orc, the razorbill, and the guillemot. And these are birds that only come to these islands in summer to breed, and they generally nest in large colonies, the great orc did, but it's now extinct because it was delicious and couldn't fly and could barely walk, so that one was kind of asking for it. Um, but what we can see is that in this period, there is a very intense focus on the summer and on using these birds en masse. If we look at, um, the, most of the data comes from the Inner Hebrides, <coughs> but we have some very small amounts of data coming in now from Shetland that suggests they were using a residency bird, the shag, but we have lots of juvenile bones, suggesting that, again, this is being used in the summer months. If we look at this a bit closer, then, the site of sand, which is kind of on the border of the Inner Hebrides, is displaying an almost exclusive focus on the orcs, and particularly the cliff-nesting razorbill and guillemot. Today, and in the historically documented past, these birds settle on their nests in March, although they can come a little earlier, and then they, their bird, their chicks fledge and leave in about August. However, they become inaccessible before this point sometimes because they're what is known as quasi-precocial, where the chicks launch themselves ineptly from the cliffs into the water, where they then continue to be raised at sea until independent. So when can you actually access these birds? And that's just to demonstrate that the next most common species are also orcs. It's very, very focused there. At Ancoran, we have a focus on the ground-nesting puffin, which lives in burrows, and on the now-extinct great hawk. And the puffin generally comes today in April. They lay their single egg in late April or May, and then parents incubate it for about 40 days, and then they raise them for another 60 days or so, and then they abandon them and make the chick fledge. The great hawk had, according to historical sources, an even shorter window of opportunity to get it when on land, about six weeks in May and June. Klokkoig, again, a great focus on the great hawk and on some other orc species, but there's also a relative number of resident birds, such as the shag. But again, we have juvenile bones, suggesting that these two are being utilised in the summer. But perhaps we have a greater range of points of the year being exploited here. Several key species exploited through time in the Scottish islands, such as the guillemot and also the gannet that we'll come on to again in a minute, would have been acquired from dangerous points of the landscape, such as cliffs or uh, rocky offshore islands. And these targeted avian species demonstrate that their capture is part of a wider picture of mobility around the seascape and the landscape at multiple points of the year, but perhaps with an intensity in the summer months for these particular resources. But in terms of seasonality and timing, if you are exploiting these birds, when do you time your fowling trips? The appearance and disappearance of certain bird species provides a limited window of opportunity. But even with resident species, such as gulls and shags and cormorants, they're more easily captured often when they're on the nest. So even these might have an opportunity factor to consider. But within this window, if you take the adult birds too soon, you won't get eggs. 
If you take eggs from the wrong species that won't relay, or if you take eggs from a species too late so that it can't relay that season, you won't get the chicks. If you time your trip wrong, the chicks will either not be at their fattiest, or they will have already fledged and you get to your island and they're all gone away. So the bird use is so closely related to understanding and observing the nuances and the passage of season and the passage of animal time and the specific incubation and raising factors of each individual species that you have to have this knowledge to be able to use these resources a lot of the time, particularly if exploiting them in large numbers. And in this Mesolithic period, we can see that the glut of resources in summer seem to have been very important to this hunter-gatherer population. <coughs> With the introduction of farming in the Neolithic, we see birds forming a lesser part of overall subsistence in the island, generally not forming a huge proportion at all, but they're still being utilised and quite important in some particular sites. <coughs> However, what we do see, though, is a greater range of species being used, and there's less focus on one particular point of the year, although in many instances, summer breeding birds, such as the orcs and the gannet, do remain important. But this more year-round uh, pattern of exploitation perhaps indicates that it's more opportunistic, as and when, perhaps when you're tending crops or animals, and less of a particular focus on we must fowl right now or we won't get any birds. A couple of interesting sites here. Uh, Toff's Nest in Orkney, lots of gulls. Some of you probably got woken up by gulls hollering at you in Cardiff this morning. We have many of them. Some of these gulls are resident birds, some are summer visitors. So exploiting a similar resource, but ones that come and go at potentially at different points of the year. There's nothing to say that they would have separated these like we did, but it's just a resource that changes depending on the point of year. At the Nap of Hower, again on Orkney, we have quite a summer focus here, in particular focusing on the breeding seabirds, guillemot, great orc and gannet. Um, and although we have, uh, again, some shagbones, which is a resident species, again, we've got juveniles suggesting perhaps, again, a summer focus. We do have some winter visitors at this site, such as the whooper swan and the great northern diver. But interestingly, most of these birds, although there's a huge range of species, could have been taken quite locally to the site. So, Papa Westre, on which the, this site is on this island, it has cliffs for the guillemots and gannets, rocky shores for the shags and cormorants, grassland for the gulls and the geese. However, if mentioned as mentioned before, if you did have to travel any distance to catch these birds, then timing is very important. So perhaps in contrast to this site, a good example of this is Late Bronze Age Clive Hallen on South Ewis in the Outer Hebrides. And here the bone assemblage for birds had a lot of gannets in it. South Ewis does not have any suitable environment for gannets to breed today. This suggests they either bred more widely in the past that the landscape was different enough to support them, which is unlikely, that they were captured at sea or as isolated breeding pairs, or that they were caught on specific fowling trips to more distant areas of the landscape, such as an offshore island or stack. If at an archaeological site you've only got small numbers of bones from a species such as this, it could suggest opportunistic capture of birds feeding at sea or isolated breeding pairs, but if you've got larger numbers, it would suggest a trip to a specific breeding colony. And at this particular site, we do have some evidence for sub-adult birds, so almost mature, but not quite, suggesting that they were probably captured on a trip to a more distant fowling colony. Gannets can arrive in January and February today, but they generally become established on their nest by March, and then they remain quite late until September. So again, we can look at this window of opportunity it's quite a long one, but when are you going to get perhaps the best return for your money? And it's here perhaps we can turn to historical sources. This one from the 16th century talks about men travelling out of the island of Lewis to go and get the birds when they had their young ripe. And so perhaps if we bring them together, we're looking at people perhaps going for birds about to fledge. These are the fattiest. They weigh more than the adults often a lot at that time, particularly the species such as the gannet, and they can contribute a lot of calorific 
uh, input by their fat and oil. And here we've got some modern ones being dried again by the men of Ness and Lewis who travelled to a stack called Sula Fugere, and they preserve these gannets as a culinary delicacy. So, time of capture, perhaps when they're fattiest. One thing that is noticeable is, I saw you shut it, <laughs> is the more liminal or isolated an island is, often the more focused on a particular season or part of the year the exploitation of birds are. And we can use bird presence to trace back species prevalent in a landscape in deep time. So this site called Sheant Isles has an island called Rough Island, very inventive with the names, and it lays between the Outer Hebrides and the Inner Hebrides. And the archaeological assemblages there were dominated by puffins, like 90-something percent in the assemblages. Many, many, many puffins. And today, these islands hold the second largest colony in Britain of puffins. And the whole landscape has changed when these birds come and they go in their burrows and everything. You can't walk without falling down puffin burrows. But the archaeological data, therefore, suggests that this time depth of large colonies goes back as far as the Iron Age and potentially belong. So we can use it to look at bird time through space and to see changes in species. For example, this site here comes from a site called Pabe, which is on lower down in the Hebridean chain, and it had lots of shags. A very famous fowling colony called Mingule lived on an island nearby and they exploited a lot of shags. Now today Pabe doesn't have an amazing colony of these birds, so it suggests that in the past, either people were going to nearby islands such as Mingule to get these birds, or that that island, Pabe, once had a large population of shags, but this has since changed. Coming into the Norse period, in the Hebrides we see a diversification of fowling, with much less focus on summer breeding seabirds and a greater use of ones that might be present all year round, and also with some introduction of domesticates such as the chicken. This is less prevalent in the Northern Isles, where we still see a focus on colony breeding seabirds, such as the orcs and the gannets. So here we're seeing differences between the island groups in their calendar of exploitation. So in the Northern Islands, they might be going more off sea to islands or offshore stacks to capture specific summer breeding ones, whereas in the Hebrides, it seems to be a broader pattern of exploitation, perhaps occurring more opportunistically. And this graph just very briefly shows in the kind of dotty, these are the summer breeding birds. So in the Hebrides, much less focused on these. And one of my favourite sites, though, is Kilfeder, again on South US in the Outer Hebrides. It's not all about the summer. We've talked a lot about summer breeding birds because these are often the most dramatic. At this site, gulls and geese were important. And we do have a large number of species present. But we also have a really large number of wading birds, in particular the golden plover. Now these birds can be present at multiple points of the year, but in winter they often form and move as large flocks, which potentially makes them easier to catch. And I think that these birds may have been caught in winter when they were moving as these dense flocks by netting or potentially by leaving snares that they get their foot in and get caught. So we can see different parts of the year providing different resources. A different calendar of opportunities, so to speak. Resource exploitation can determine or influence human movement about the landscape to different habitats at different points of the year. For example, cliffs in the early summer for eggs, or inland water for wintering waterfowl, or the grassland for birds feeding at multiple points of the year. It is a living landscape. The birds exploited through time in the Scottish islands could have changed the landscape quite dramatically depending on the point of year, both visually, but also in terms of the resources present and audibly. These are some gannets making a hell of a row. They dramatically impact all sensory parts of your yearly experience. I was going to play you a puffin, but they literally just go and groan at you, so we're not going to do that. The arrival of summer breeders would have heralded the approach of warmer weather and a potential glut of bird resources, and their departure marked the end of this period and beckoned the oncoming of winter. But new visitors could appear then and provide meat, fresh meat and fat. You might wake up to the call of a lark and sleep to the screech of an owl. You might well sit there and wait for the return of these migrating birds on a daily basis and from longer migrations. 
There are few animals whose presence and absence can vary so dramatically at different points of the year, or who can make their temporal movements known in the land, the sea, and the sky. And this mobility intimately links birds to seasonality and timekeeping, both in the Scottish islands, but also much further afield. Thank you.